our laws as it pertains to substances are draconian and bizarre. The psychopaths start this way. He was an alcoholic because of social media and pornography, PTSD, love addiction, fentanyl and heroin, ridiculous. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a doctor for <laughs> sake. Where the hell you think I learned that? I'm just saying, you go to treatment before you kill people. I am a clinician. I observe things about these chemicals. Let's just deal with what's real. We used to get these calls on Loveline all the time. Educate adolescents and to prevent and to treat. If you have trouble, you can't stop and you want to help stop it. I can help. I got a lot to say. I got a lot more to say. And here we are. Thank you all for joining us. Uh, happy Tuesday, everybody. Uh, as I said yesterday, we have a, a full week coming up. Tomorrow, we have uh, Danny Casale. And on Thursday, we have Sam Keen. So we'll be here every day through Thursday, tomorrow at 2.30 uh, and Thursday at 2.30. And today, we have Dr. Jessica Hockman. She is a board-certified pediatrician uh, and a Conejo Valley rep native. She is uh, a leader in pediatrics, where she is a fellow at the American Academy of Pediatrics. Been recognized as of 2019 and 20 as a Southern California rising star by the Super Doctor magazine. And uh, indeed, I know her through Christina P. I've noticed also on the restream, there was a lot of your mom's house language flying around with you guys. Flora May and Tom's, I see you there. But uh, Christina B. hangs out with Jessica, and that's how we got to know each other, amongst other things which we can discuss. Jessica, welcome to the program. Thank you so much. I'm really there excited to be here. I'm... And this and Dr. Hockman is from her office in the Valley. Uh, your Instagram, do we have that up? There it is. It's uh, Ask Dr. Jessica, which you said was uh, named by Christina P., in fact. <laughs> yes, it was. Yes? Yes. So let's, let's kind of get into this. Um, I feel a little copycat thing going on here, though. As far as what? As far as what? Ask Dr. Drew. Oh, ask Dr. Oh. Jessica. Well, it's okay though. That's, that's what I was thinking. Is, that out loud. No, yeah, it's, it's that actually Christina admired what you had done, Susan, and she was I, paying homage to it. And I appreciate it. that. Yeah, that's all. Great minds. So we give well, up. it's you know. So Susan gets the credit. Yeah, Susan gets the credit for all of. What no, we I do. think it was actually Caleb. Caleb thought the name. Okay. Caleb, right. <clears throat> yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so again, uh, what is I've it? Copying is the greatest. Like... You like oh, what? I like, I like Dr. Pinsky also. I like well, the ring what, of the Dr. reason Pinsky. that the reason that happened is I was all right in 1983, 1984. I had an opportunity to go on this rock radio station in Los Angeles because I lived essentially across the street, and they were trying to create a community service show. And at the time, one Anthony Fauci was telling us, we were deep in the AIDS epidemic then, and I was seeing mo most of my training was on AIDS patients. And uh, he was out there saying, you know, you young guy, you got to get out there and educate about how this thing's transmitted. No one's talking about it. And we have to tell the narrative and get, you know, get people hooked into the, uh, the to changing their behavior. There was no, never a hint of authoritarianism, never a sort of judge, judgment in what we were saying. It was all just... Let's look at some cases and see what happens. And let's talk about a narrative and let's make some fun with this and let's have some music at the same time. And guess what? We changed people's behavior. Fauci was uh, was on the leading edge of that and I followed suit. And when I went up there the first few times, I didn't want people to be to think of me as promoting myself. So I just I hid who I was for years. I just used my first name wow. instead of my last name. So that's where that came from. Wow. Do you, um, oh, do you ever crazy. regret it? Do you ever wish you were called Dr. Pinsky? No, I, I don't regret it because I was able to create kind of a set. I, I was called Dr. Pinsky in my, you know, 14 hours a day, right? And that was, that was plenty, trust me. And uh, th this gave me an opportunity to sort of create something other that had a different name to it even. So it, it was, it is, there is a weird piece to it though. I, I noticed when we started doing celebrity rehab, I noticed every single person we admitted did not use their real name. There's some interesting wow. thing that people do when they get out in the media. They, 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 they shift to some version of themselves, but not themselves. And the, the names shift with it. So kind of interesting. But also, it was like back in the day when there was Dr. Ruth, Dr. Laura, Dr. You know, everybody was like, yeah. Phil. Like, well, I, that was I, later. I got to say, I wasn't even thinking that way. I just it sounded better. Too. I just thought. Uh, this kind of works. I, I don't want anybody to know I'm doing this. I, I feel like I need to do it as a community service. So I'll just 
I'll just, we'll just call it this. I, it was really a guy, an impulsive thing. It was not like I thought it out for days. It was like that first night I thought, Oh shit, what are they going to call me? Okay. Just call me this. You know, and that was, that was it. I'm, um, I'm just thinking about right, how so, tired, how tired I must've been. You must've been to work 14 hour days by one name and then work in radio and media after that. That sounds like a well, long, the, long day. The, that was what, that was when it was two hours on Sunday nights only. So okay. for 10 years, it was just on Sunday nights. And so I, if I was on call or something, I wouldn't go in. And it was Sunday nights. And it, when it went to five nights a week, that forced me to shorten my days to like 10, 12 hours, that kind of thing. And um, yeah, I know. And, and then it also, the time. well, hold on. The, the, week they, the week they decided to put it on five nights a week was the week that Susan got pregnant with triplets. They offered me this five <laughs> night a week thing. And she goes, that's not community service anymore. You have to get paid if you're leaving. Cause I wasn't being paid. You have you 50 get paid. bucks. Yeah. A so show for or $50 a show hat in hand. I asked for $50 a show <laughs> and that's what I was paid at the beginning there. Um, and that's sort of, that was 19. So I started managing him. I was managing him at that point and said, you don't bring a paycheck home. Forget about it. Yeah. Get out of there. Get out of there. If they, if they won't pay you, you got to be home doing diapers. And, uh, the woman behind that the was man. my crash. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. Trust me. Show me the money, honey. Yeah. She's been there, but, but that was my crash course in pediatrics. I, I thought I had some understanding of pediatrics until I had tri triplets. When I realized it really is a very different discipline. And let me, and let me start out with something that I found frustrating. And you tell me if it was just the pediatricians I was dealing with, or if there's something about how pediatrics pediatricians are trained, but in internal medicine, everything has at least a provisional construct to it, a name, a diagnosis. The, the theory is you can't render a treatment because treatments are studied in the context of a specific diagnosis. So no diagnosis, no treatment. Now it can be provisional, right? You can adjust your diagnostic construct with time, but you have to have some sort of diagnostic construct. I could not get my pediatricians to tell me what was going on with my kids. I would just go, what, what do you, a fever for four days has a name when you're an internist. It's a, there's a name for that. What's the name for this thing? And and then my kids ended up with some very bizarre stuff that, that uh, Susan, in retrospect. Well, the one thing was, you know how they measure their heads when they're babies or infants and they go, you're in the 75 percentile, you're in the 100 percentile, you're in the, you know, 60. Douglas was in the 100 percentile. And we're like, oh, he has a big head. And then like. 12 months in, he got on, he had an arachnoid cyst growing in his brain stem on his left cerebe cerebellum. And, you know, it's like, well, you got triplets wow. and two are in the 75 percentile. Why didn't you look at the one with the 100 percentile? Like they're all pretty much should be about the same. Well, well, that was that, the one thing I was like, well, that kind of goes to look well, like, that goes why are you the, measuring them in the first place? To me, it all kind of went in the right. same category, which kid, look, kid looks fine. Kid looks fine. And they told me he was willful because he would he would like cry when he ate because he couldn't swallow because it was, you know, something to do with his swallowing reflex. And but, he was really grumpy. Let's, after let's not, your, this is your personal. Well, I, that was the first real yeah, main but, like thing that and, you know, there were I didn't go think to go to a neurologist. That wasn't like my next move because right. his head was bigger than the other. two. Right. No one would have sent you. That's the fact. It's no true. One there's there's and so, certain basic things. Oh, there's certain basic yeah. things we do at every well child check where we check weight and growth and head circumference. And they seem like really, you know, simple things to do, but they really matter. So I think a good pediatrician will, you know, will follow it and track it. And most of the time kids do grow and they do great, but it's for those moments where there is something wrong, you definitely want to be on top of it. It did yeah, 100, 100 percentile. I I wasn't mad at the guy, but I didn't know what that meant. You know, I didn't go. And, well, and so what, what about, especially the, if there's the a training? change, if there's a change in percentiles, he didn't oh, change. He a, started a, high and stayed high. He started high, stayed high. Oh, that's, that's the reality. Yeah. And, yeah. and so, it, so I, there's no way it's asking too much for that had been referred as far as I'm concerned. I, I, that, I didn't hold that on anyone, but, but I, I think there were, right. uh, there were many, yeah, there were many other situations where I was like, this should have a name, at least so I understand what we're dealing with. Can I and ask her a question? When I'm done, I got to make this one so, point. I so insist on it. How many kids have 100 percentile heads? I'm just. Uh, one crazy. out of 100. I mean, <laughs> you know, out of, that's what the growth percentiles are, that out of, out of 100, 
Um, you know, one kid right. will be at the 100th percentile, one will be at the 75th, one will be at the one percentile. But what really matters, right. what, what, I, what I find interesting is one family history, because large heads tend to run in families, and then the change in percentile. So I always, you know, perks my ears if a kid was 50th and then the next visit they're 75th. That's unusual. So a rapid okay. change in growth. That, that, um, but as far really, as the naming of the fevers, did, I agree happen. with you. It yeah. didn't happen good. So, so is, but, but is there something about the training that you, because what I would always get back is kid looks fine. Kid looks fine. Kid looks fine. And if the kid looks fine, it's like, you guys stop thinking. It's, it's like, and I go, no, 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 you could, I don't want you to stop thinking it. Kid looks fine. I, I want, I want to know what this is, uh, even just to right. satisfy my own curiosity. And, and one of the times right. we had three kids going all at once. One of the time it was pneumonia. One of the time it was murine typhus. And, you know, I mean, it was like, we could keep thinking, please. There, this again. Is, yeah. One of the times You've it was staph it sepsis. Yeah. Oh my God. Wow. We, we had like a full. Douglas again. Oh yeah. We had, we had all kinds of crazy stuff. Oh, Douglas. And, and wow. you know, and then we had the fenest, fenestrated arachnoid cyst and we're, we're, we get traumatized. We, we get, we get PT, we have PTSD symptoms when we talk about uh, early childhood stuff, both of us. That's why we're yelling at each other right Yeah, now. wondering if your kids are <laughs> so, going to come out normal after brain surgery is pretty frightening, yeah. i got to say. And, and post-surgery, he had something, I thought I knew something about neurosurgery too. He had something I'd never seen before or heard of, posterior fossa syndrome. You ever heard of that? I have. I hadn't. I have, and that was nasty. <laughs> Thank God for Decadron. That was terrible. That's scary. That was nasty and awful. Yeah, it was scary. I like Decadron. So. You do? <laughs> Good steroids? Yeah, I do. I had she's high, she's high in it right now, as a matter of I fact. I had a couple of weeks ago <laughs> when I had my stem cell infusion. Everybody goes, yeah, you and your stupid stem cells. Um, but but it did make me really agitated. And, and Douglas had to take it to shrink his brain, which I, you know, I'm not a doctor, so this is all new to me. But I, I was really glad that it worked. So no, so am I, am I right that, that the training is you a are, little bit of a gestalt on do, does the child look bad or not? And the, that's when I, you I really think, start thinking is when, the, yeah. That's right. I mean, I think a lot of it is what, when to worry. So a lot of kids get fevers and the truth is there's, it's usually from a virus is most of the time. And there's hundreds and hundreds of viruses. So I think the big picture is we have to let parents know and give them instruction when to worry, you know, so if they have a fever, but they're still eating well and acting well, um, you know, less cause for concern. But now I'll tell you, we have um, better ability to check what we call viral panel. So I can actually swab in a child's nose and check for you know the 27 most common viruses. So sometimes we can't actually get more of an answer. Um, the problem there is sometimes insurance doesn't cover it. And then I feel really bad if a parent right. gets a large bill when the truth is yeah. it doesn't often change management. It doesn't usually change the advice I give. Um, well, with the, which you know, is what, yeah, which is what's interesting to me. So, so th this is to, to, to your point, invariably it really didn't make a difference it, it really didn't in, in the reality of how the how things unfolded for each child's particular situation except the, the one the arachnoid cyst which was essentially a, a moon rock you know an asteroid hitting in our backyard that was just weird um i've never seen but one. the other ones i i, I bet uh in and believe me, when we—it's a long story. But even, even when we were I, we were looking at the CAT scan, they called me back there and they went, "We think it's an artifact." I go, I, "Artifacts don't move the fourth ventricle." I, I come on, they—they <laughs> they like didn't want to acknowledge what was going on. It was very strange. Um, so the the reality is, it it the kids did do fine. They were right that it was going to turn out fine. But personally, because of my training, I just need to know. That's just sort of how my training goes. So I'd be one of those parents. And this is an interesting point like th that you, we should be asking parents, do you want to know, do you want to maybe spend $800 to know, even though your insurance right. might cover? I would say, yes, I would do it. Personally, I would right. do it. And, so and maybe if I were, uh, I, Susan, would you do it? You, would you want to know what you were dealing with a good deal of uh, certainty? Or would you be like, okay, they, they tell me the kid looks fine. Cause you come from a family where you'll die of something else. I like certainty, but I, the problem is I live with two doctors. So like your dad would come in and go, Oh, he's got typhus. Like, and I'd be like, well, why did the pediatrician, you know, right? It, but I think, I don't know. He was also a really good older doctor. Like 
I don't know. Well, he he Kids he are, was. I don't know. He I, was the I one. I don't want that, to shit on my pediatrician. I like them. They no, they good. did a great job. It's just it's just it's a it's a curiosity. I've always wanted to ask a pediatrician about. It. That's why I'm sort of. I wanted the neurologist to no, I, I actually he seem to. I get into this with my husband a lot because he's an internist and he teases that pediatricians have such this, you know, blase attitude. And as an internist, they really think about the differential or all the possibilities and they yes. think things through. Yes. So I hear that. From yes. All the time. And we, yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, good. It's not just, it's not just me because literally it would be like anathema for an internist to go, you look fine. I'll see you in two weeks or three weeks. It's just like, no, yeah. we, we, we were, we will be wrong before we'll say, eh, whatever. It, because we, we, you know, part of our training was just destroying each other around those issues, right? You stand at the bedside and go, what right. is this? What is it? Why? Defend it. Give me some literature. Tell me again. Refine it tomorrow. Right. And th that's the right. training. And, and I remember in my pediatric rotations, it wasn't quite so much. And in fact, God, this is so interesting. I hadn't thought of this in years and years and years. The, one of the pediatric residents went, oh, I don't know how those internists remember all those differentials. And I thought, there aren't that many. And pediatricians are, in a weird way, kind of dealing with more because you're dealing with completely different differentials at different stages of development. Right. You know, when right. you're dealing with infants versus babies versus children versus adults, these are like entirely different systems you're operating with. That's the part I found right. challenging about pediatrics. But they don't get you know, as really sick and as often about as adults. Oh, sorry. Which is no, I why think adults are a lot more, a more cavalier about it. That's true. Right. Yeah. Well, especially older adults. Older adults, is sh shit goes down. I mean, I, just shit goes down. I can't imagine, adults. though, being a pediatrician during this COVID experience. All right. So that's what I want to get into. That's I mean, that, 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 I just to add a little oil onto the flame for you. Okay. So that's what I want to get into, <laughs> it, which is how has the, first of all, how has this been for you, COVID? Um, it's been it's been OK. It's been interesting. I think um, I've gone through waves in the very beginning. Um, it was really difficult, in all honesty, because my, I have three little kids. They're in elementary school and their schools were closed. They're in LAUSD. And to uh, layer on top of that, um, I work with my father, who's 70. And so in the very beginning, you know, a lot of there's a lot of concern. Should he be working still? And he was working. And so I felt a little bit of guilt to be, you know, carrying the burden of I was trying to see more of the sicker patients in our office, um, but he, you know, he didn't complain. He was happy to be here, but it was more of my own personal guilt trying to figure out how scary COVID, you know, was how how to protect ourselves from getting it, and then managing uh, my kids at home. But but overall, I think it's been a good experience in some ways. I've learned a lot. Um, it, it makes me it reaffirms how much I like what I do. Just the role of you know being there for families and growing relationships with my patients. Um, and, and, and being here when I'm needed. So, you know, I wouldn't, uh, and so I wouldn't, going, looking back, extent, it wouldn't change my profession. Oh well, yeah. I understand that. <laughs> uh, the extent to which PD, the, you, you witnessed COVID, what, what were the cases like? Did you, what, what kind of gestalt, what kind of impression did you come away with about COVID in pediatric populations? That's a great question. Um, honestly, in the very beginning, I was really nervous to see my first positive COVID cases. And as time went on, I kept seeing more and more COVID cases. I was really um, pleasantly surprised at how well kids were doing. I think um, of all the kids I've seen, really, they I've been lucky. They've all done well. I haven't had to hospitalize any patients who have had COVID. Um, you know, I'll see kids. I had a six-week-old that had a fever for a couple of days. Um, I think some of the teenagers tend to get more of the flu-like symptoms. But overall, um, kids have done very well. I haven't seen any cases of MISC. I haven't had to hospitalize any patients. To be honest, the hardest part uh, is that there's so much anxiety around COVID. Um, I've had a number of parents, you know, hyperventilate on the phone when I give them the news that their child has COVID. Um, dealing with the quarantine procedures, I think, has been really stressful on families, figuring out how to stay home from school and parents' work situations. But I really do think the blessing of COVID, um, if there is a blessing, has really just been how well kids have been doing. Right. And, and so if you were to describe the average p child COVID case, are they, are they even, do they even seem sick? Do they just have a little cough, sore throat? What's sort of average presentation? In my experience as an outpatient pediatrician, so this is I work, you know, as the frontline, not kids that have been in the hospital. So that pediatrician may have yep. a different perspective. 
But for myself, yeah. most cases were picked up asymptomatically. So the child had no symptoms and they were picked up from screens going to school, screens playing in sports. And then I get the phone call from the families about their positive case. So most kids I've seen have had no symptoms. And then I would say after that, more like uh, cold-like symptoms, uh, stuffy nose for a couple of days, maybe fever. Um, but overall, I, I, I mild or asymptomatic. A nothing. A, a nothing. And, and so yeah. did they, on average, did they transmit to other family members? Do you have that sort of data in your head? A sense so of what this, this is a great household? question. Yeah, so very often, you know, parents brace themselves, they separate the children, um, they're expecting there to be, um, you know, cases spread within the family. Most of the time when there's a case that, that I found a, a child where they were symptomatic, they generally get it from an adult. They generally got it from a parent mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. um, or from another adult. A lot of times I did not see sibling to sibling spread, um, but sometimes I did. But again, most of those cases were asymptomatic. Now, as I say this, there's though, I, I do recognize that there are sick kids out there that have had COVID and have, and have been sick. But in my experience, uh, luckily, they've been very mild. Yeah, well, but I mean, you look, the, obviously, the people in the hospital yes. are, are seeing the funnel of kids that aren't doing well. You're seeing the broad landscape. And if you were a right. hospitalist in a pediatric unit, you would have a skewed view of pediatric COVID. It wouldn't look like the average COVID case. It would look like the average complicated COVID case, which is unusual or rare. And, you know, there's data that, yes. that only 15% of spouses will contract COVID from their spouse, that it's a relatively small number. There's usually some household transmission, but it's unusual for the whole household to get it. It usually goes right. like in my house, I was sick. I brought it in. We, there were, it was Christmas Eve. There were 10 people here. I gave it to one of my sons. That was it. That was it. That wow. was the transmission. And Susan, and Susan slept next to me the entire night. I thought I was um, sick from the the scotch that Adam Carolla was <laughs> ladling down my throat. You woke throat. up with a hangover. Yeah, and and in the morning she Thank you, kiss, Adam. she kisses my forehead and goes, uh oh, and she jumped out of bed and ran. I never didn't see her again for two weeks. I never touch him. I don't know why I touched him. It was it was I was having a dream. Uh -oh. <laughs> that I was singing the 12 days of COVID. We made up this song and it, it we, I was singing at my sleep and it was, I thought it was a gift from God telling me that my husband had COVID. So I, I don't know. I woke up, fell his head and I didn't see him for 10 days. Yeah. And, uh, and, and yeah, yeah, I did. I think it was my mom singing it to me. Oh my God. That, that is becoming elaborate. This is all right. She's going to think memory is a repeatedly reconstructed phenomenon. And the, trust me, the, the version of the memory as it exists oh, today is nowhere song, near the one that happened. Uh, let's say immediately following I events we're myself. discussing. But That's anyway, I, I have, I have hyperthymesia a little bit, which is sort of, I have ridiculous autobiographical memory. So, so and, and one of our sons has even more so that I know it's and, and so everything. so for he and I when we see everybody else's memories we're like okay <laughs> I did yeah, I <laughs> oh, had yeah, the dream memory, the twelve okay. days of COVID the same for night. us we just we play the tape back we literally can play a tape I, back you don't remember like, that you you had that around that time. no I had yes. it on Christmas Eve yes there there was that was flying around a couple of times <laughs> but that particular night. I was fitful all night because I thought I was having something. Yeah, you were probably else. waking me up. Yeah, and and you woke but up and I said I wasn't feeling. Didn't so you great. tell you? T didn't you say I was singing it in my sleep? Not that night. Oh, not that night. Oh, so wow. that's how that's how memory works. But anyway, so so, so anyway, it's all good. Who I cares? don't believe you. Uh, you you can pretty much you, you had bank, COVID. You now can bank just give on me it. a break, okay? So um, <laughs> so let's go go back to the. Uh, what, are, what does this DX mean that everyone's putting up here on our, I don't know what that means, guys, on you on YouTube? Uh, there's a whole Diagnosis. stream of people on the restream. Yeah, that's what I would think, but the, but it isn't in response to anything that I can see. Let me see, hold on. Let me see where it starts. Yeah, I don't know what that was all about. Anyway, so yeah, we have been talking about diagnoses. That's what, that's our, that's our sort of thing. And Jessica's husband's a, an oncologist, and so he uh, thinks in terms of diagnostic spectra. Those, those are the guys that have to think about in, in extraordinary detail, extraordinary detail when they, when they think about what they're dealing with. I mean, they, they, as, as oncology has progressed, you know, we're, we're now down to what's your genetic, you know, what's your code and then how do you address right. that person's code? So it's getting wilder right. and wilder in his field. 
Um, he's well. He's actually an, in, so, an internist. He. But, I thought he was an oncologist. Is he not an oncologist? No, he he Why likes oncology, but he's an internist. Oh, that's well, good. It's it's he's close. one of the. He's the guy like me who just does general medicine, which is rare these days. So it's true. Uh, so back to the kids and COVID. So kids and COVID, they don't transmit that much. They're often asymptomatic. They're contracting it from adults and they uh, have natural immunity subsequently. Have you been looking at the natural immunity data in kids? How does that look? Yeah, it actually looks, I mean, I think what's tricky with kids is it's clear that natural immunity works, but I think where the, the nuance is, is that it's unclear if the asymptomatic cases, um, if those kids make a lot of natural immunity, but it's very clear that, that there is a benefit to, you know, I would never wish a kid to get COVID, but there is a, a real benefit in terms of natural immunity reinfection rates are much, are very low. In fact, the, um, the study that the trial for Pfizer, where they looked at children to get approval for emergency use authorization approval for the age five to 11, 20% um, mm -hmm. of the kids in both the placebo and the vaccine group um, had evidence of prior infection of COVID and none of those oh, kids got reinfected. Yeah, not in either group. So, so, you know, so and, this and, is and, the category of, go ahead. And it also looks that, you know, it's possible to get reinfected, but most kids by far, when they do get reinfected, it's not symptomatic illness. So they may get a positive screen in their nose or test positive, but they're not actually showing symptoms. So, so for, for what you're describing, which is this natural immunity plus vaccine uh, is something we're characterizing now as hybrid immunity. And there is a lot of people who are starting to talk quietly, somewhat in public, but sort of quietly, about the possibility of hybrid immunity being the future for all of us, you know, sort of ideally, really, uh, in that the hybrid immunity, in a sense, one of the models would be, well, you get the vaccine, then soon after that, you get the infection, so you have a mild infection, and now you have spike protein and um, natural immunity, so you have broad immunity and high immunity on the spike protein, which is, that's what I did. I had natural immunity and then I took the vaccine also. And, and I think I might've been re-exposed. I was just looking, I, I've got a big antibody profile I do that I'm part of a research protocol and everything went up for me and since uh, three months ago. Like my neutralizing antibodies went up and I thought, wow, the only way that happens is if I, I'm reinfected. So, so I, I may have been exposed, which is interesting. And it's another interesting model for how natural immunity works. But the, the question though becomes, uh, is hybrid immunity something that's being talked about in pediatric circles? Have you heard people talk about that? I haven't. I did read that study from Israel where they, uh, I think it was, it's still in preprint, but they had one group that got the vaccine, one group that got the vaccine and natural immunity, and then the other group that just got natural immunity. And it was clear that the group that had um, the illness and one dose of the mRNA vaccine had the best immunity of all. Right. So I do think there's something right. to say for uh Hybrid that high, I never heard hybrid. that term, but hybrid immunity. Yeah. Yeah. It's called hybrid immunity. I talked to an infectious disease guy, uh, academic up in San Francisco, and he was sort of, he raised the issue as like, I mean, why are we wearing masks after being vaccinated? We kind of, maybe we should be, in, he, he wasn't ready to say it yet, but he's saying, well, one model would be we encourage people to get infected in the first six months after they get the vaccine. So what, what's with the masks? And, and speaking of masks, <laughs> I don't what think is anyone would ever mask? go for yeah. that though. Well, what, they, what is it? when they say endemic, hang on a second, I'll talk about the mask in a second, but when they say endemic, yes. that's what they're talking about. They're talking about a, a pool of virus that repeatedly reinfects everybody. That's what endemic right. means. And so right. they're kind of under their breath saying the same thing. So masks, how, how do you perceive the mask wearing in kids and, and its efficacy and its potential adverse effects on kids? So masks are a great question. They've become a very um, divided issue. Um, so I'll just tell you how I feel about it. I think there's definitely a role for masks. I think especially when transmission rates are high, um, especially when, you know, I think when kids are in indoors closed settings, I think there's a role for masks. Um, but the data actually looks, you know, it's interesting because I always like to back up the advice with good data. Um, and 
It's really unclear. I mean, I think I would love for America to compare ourselves to what other countries are doing that don't have such strict mm -hmm. masking protocols. So for example, mm -hmm. in the UK, they don't, uh, they don't recommend masking or they don't enforce masking under 12 years old. So I'm very curious, you know, what, how our, how our rates compare to their rates. Um, so I don't really mind masking so much indoors. My, my concern is that there's no, it doesn't seem that there's an end in sight. No, you know, no one's explaining at mm -hmm. what point will the mask come off? I would love to hear, you know, public officials say, for example, well, you know, when we get down to 10 cases per every hundred thousand, we can safely remove the mask. Or my other issue is that outdoors that, uh, you know, in schools, they're encouraging masking outdoors at my child's elementary that's, school. That, that, yeah. That's and I, insane. I, there's that's, no data it, to back nuts. that up. I no, think. no, no, there is a ton of data to back up the, <laughs> the opposition opposite opinion, which is there's no outdoor transmission. There's just no, I mean, it's extremely right. unusual. Uh, right. And, so I, I would love to hear data, where the end is. And the data on masks that we do have, I, I, Walensky, the head of the CDC just the other day said that it's 80% effective. I don't know where she got that yeah. data. The only data I've seen is out of Bangladesh and Denmark, which puts it around right. 15, 20 at, at best. It's not zero. I get it's not zero, but it's not, it's not even 50%. And people treat it as though not wearing it is being a murderer. You know, it's like, mm, it's not right. the way it works. And, and, and I was right. talking to a group of teachers. I gave a lecture to a group of teachers and that we were talking about the mental health issues that have come out of COVID, which are profound. And the data is sure. terrible. Yeah. And they, they asked a simple question, what do we do? I said, well, you know, what normally I do is drink, first of all, get down to the kid's level, look them in the eye, reflect on your face exactly what you feel they're feeling. This reflective function has a reaches the midbrain in a way that words don't. And I was explaining all this stuff and they went, but the mask. And I thought, oh, you can't even, you can't even help these kids. You can't even do what you need to do to, to right. help to reduce the stress, improve emotional regulation. It, it, it's so right. disturbing to me. Yeah. There's a lot to it. I think, um, you know, I think people are really attached to the idea that masking um, will prevent, absolutely prevent COVID transmission. And I just don't think that's the reality. I think kids wear them imperfectly. You know, I'll see kids, I, I don't know if they're dirty, they're touching them. Um, and actually the Bangladesh study, I don't believe showed a benefit in children. I think it was more, you know, the 50 year olds and older. That's right. Um, that's right. I didn't my, want to my even, say that, even say that, but I think that's true. Yep. Yeah. I mean, I, uh, you know, I do think in it, most kids are very resilient. So I do think that tr most kids that wear masks, um, are doing very well and they're compliant and they don't complain, but I see it with my, my kids' friends, some of them wear, wear glasses, they get foggy, they're irritating. Um, mm -hmm. you know, a lot of kids that have, um, they're learning to read like my, my daughter's in kindergarten. It's, I think it's really stressful on the teacher to teach how to, how to blend and how to pronounce, um, you know, and I think, I think ultimately oh, it would sense. be nice to have an endpoint to see the mask come off at some point, especially as rates come down. And on, honestly, yeah, and especially as kids do so well from COVID, I think there's this, um, in my mind, there's a big exaggeration, a big, uh, there's an exaggerated response to cases for kids. So, you know, my question always is, okay, there's a case in, in the class, but what happened with that case? Did it lead to any hospitalization? Did it lead to a child really getting sick? Because most of the time, by far and away, the answer is they did not get really sick. It just resulted in, you know, a case, the kid went home, um, which to me is not a public health emergency in any way. Yeah. Right, right, of course. But, but that's uh, look, what's happening. Even in my age group, I'm right. Even in my age group, the risk is 1%. <laughs> 5% at worst, you know, even if I have moderate to severe and, and, it, and, and I, you know, I've always said that, you know, when I had my prostate cancer treated, they told me you have a 90% probability of cure. And I thought, well, that's cure. <laughs> that's it. That's when doctors talk like that. 90% yeah. is that that's it. Now, when we say 99%, we're saying, don't even think about it. Because yeah, when I got COVID, one of the strangest questions I got was, were you afraid? You had, you had COVID too, right, Jessica? I did. I did. We had it around the same time, yeah. actually. So. Yeah. There, were you, were yeah. you afraid? Were you afraid? I was like, was I afraid? Did, did you get people asking you, were you scared? Were you afraid? Yeah. A lot of people are still shocked when I tell them I had COVID. And honestly, I was never truly worried for myself, just knowing the, the risk no. factors and my, my age group. Right. I was more worried that I passed it to a patient. 
you know, which thankfully I didn't. Of course, of course, that was more of course. Concern. I mean, were, were you scared? It's like 99% good outcome. How, how could I be scared? I wanted to stay out of the hospital. I didn't want to take a hospital bed. I wanted to get better as fast as I could. I took monoclonal right. antibodies. I tried to preach about that back when people didn't seem to know about it. Yeah. Are, are they giving monoclonal antibodies that to kids? That was when it was political. If too. they get sick? No, not for kids. Not for kids. Yeah. Not Even yet. Not that sick. I know, but I don't think it's approved under 18. Yeah. I haven't, I haven't read that. I don't, I don't believe so. Not under 18, but I do That's think there's an issue. I think I've noticed the big divide is that is, is the personal tolerance to risk. You know, like you're saying mm -hmm. 90% to you is cure, yeah. but there's a lot of people that, you know, they, it's, it's really hard to hear of any kid having a bad outcome. And so I think, you know, and then we have these really, um, I don't, I don't know if the word draconian is too strong, but very strong measures at the, you know, just to prevent any problem. And I think, I think there's a place where it's gone too far with children. Oh, th that place is, yes, that we're, we're <laughs> in that place. And then that of course dovetails into vaccine therapies. I, I mandate vaccine. One thing I, I, I'm glad to see vaccines for every age group, yes. but mandated vaccine. Then I, then I'm a little, Hmm. Now there are plenty yes. of mandated vaccines out there. H how do you think about the mandated vaccines as compared to these vaccines? No, it's a really good question. I, I am very, as you said, I'm very for the vaccine. I'm excited to offer it to families. I've had a number of, you know, we're offering in our office. I've been giving them myself and it's actually been exciting for a lot of families. There's an, you know, there's an, there's a sense of joy in the air, especially parents where their kids have, you know, higher risk conditions. Um, they've been waiting mm -hmm. for it and I'm thrilled to offer it. However, I do think there's a big jump to go from encouraging, educating, um, you know, providing to, to mandating. I, um, I'm, I, I find that when I talk to parents, um, with a more, with an open mind, hearing them, listening to their concerns and questions, to me, that seems like a much better, um, way to approach it. And I also think mm -hmm. in the end, um, it builds more trust, more confidence. Um, but yeah, I worry, I, 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 I worry that, um, in psychology, there's a phenomenon called control and resist. And I worry that mm -hmm. not for everybody, but for a lot of people, when they feel controlled, their response is to dig their heels in more. And, um, mm -hmm. I see that happening with some of my patients. They're, they're really unhappy that they feel like the choice is taken from them. Um, mm -hmm. so on, on one hand, I, I understand the idea behind a mandate. I think people are so, you know, tired of COVID and they view this as a way just to end it once and for all to stamp out the virus. But I look at it like it's not a perfect vaccine. We're still going to get breakthrough cases. We don't know how long the immunity is going to last for, even though we know it, it is effective at preventing symptomatic illness. Um, but I think, I think the benefit to making it a mandate, I don't see it, um, and to be honest, especially where I worry is with children to take away school from them, I think is a really big deal. Yeah, no kidding. Uh, I, I also think that, th you know, this is a vaccine that has side effects. It just is. And if you consciously make that decision to vaccinate your kid and have an unfortunate, you know, side effect, that's different than the government forcing you to do something to a healthy kid and the healthy kids get sick. That's where vaccines right. get destroyed. That's where vaccine right. he hesitancy goes crazy. And so I yes. am so fearful that what's going to happen is you're going to get three or four bad myocarditis cases and that's right. it. The whole world will explode because they were mandated to get sick. And right. I, I really worry about that. I, I think that's pretty crazy. Well, I, I think in medicine, it's really important to stay humble. And I feel like mandating this early mm -hmm. on, um, it takes out nuance. It takes out um, the mm -hmm. feeling that questioning and, and improving um, can happen. So for example, there's, a, there's really good data that, you know, for, for many kids, that one dose may be sufficient. In Israel, they showed 100% effectiveness mm -hmm. um, in kids in the you know, 12 and up uh, age range. I think 12 to 15 year old Adrian with just one shot um, or, or what about teenage boys? Because we know that the myocarditis risk really happens with the second dose in the teenage boys. Mm -hmm. What if for those children, mm -hmm. um, 
you know, maybe the Johnson and Johnson's a better vaccine for them, or maybe, or, or we wait three months or something in between vaccines right. or something, you know, who knows? Right. We don't know. It's not been studied. Right. right. Yeah. yeah. There's good data that waiting in the UK that waiting three months may be, um, may provoke a, a higher antibody response. It's true. So I, I worry that mandates remove the ability or, you know, encouraging discussion and nuance. Well, let's take a little break. And We're here with Justin Hawkman. You can. What's that? And what? Say oh, it again. and the, a couple other things. The, the kids that have had COVID in the past, maybe one, maybe one vaccine would be sufficient. For sure, for sure, for sure. And and we're not seeing the myocarditis when J and J, right? No, there's that one in a million clotting risk yeah. with with women yeah. in particular, yeah, yeah. but uh, yeah. yeah, not uh, myocarditis. And, and, uh, and me, I woke up after my Johnson Johnson vaccine with uh, raccoon eye, and that's the presenting oh manifestation presenting manifestation of a transverse sinus thrombosis. So I'd look in the mirror like, no, come on. But I have a but blurry photo nothing, of that. Oh, and do you really? That's too yeah, funny. Show we, me. We tried to find a better one, but this is the, the one. The <laughs> yeah, you can't really get. see it anymore. Can't see we it. took we that get a, a better screenshot one. off your show. Yeah. Look at his, look, look You've at had his everything. right eye. Like, it was of on course. the outside. It was like kind of blue and it kind of puffed his eyeball out a little can't bit. Really. It looks like eyeliner. See how it, I know. It's pretty funny. Yeah, but it was, it was, I thought, wow, is this really I had to put happen? makeup on it. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah, so fuck, let's take I'm a sorry. little break. We're talking to Jessica Hockman. You can uh, follow her at. Is it uh, Hockman or Hotchman? Hockman. Hockman. And you can okay. follow Hockman. at Instagram.com slash ask. See, I was doctor, wrong. Ask DR Jessica. And uh, we'll take a little break. We'll be right back with more. And we might get some of your questions over on, uh, on Clubhouse. We'll check that out as well. I see some of you sitting over there. We might get a couple of questions in. And uh, we'll be right back after this. I want to give a shout out to our good friends at Blue Mics. If you've heard my voice on this show any time over the past year, including right now, you've been listening to Blue Microphones. And let me tell you, after more than 30 years in broadcasting, I don't think I have ever sounded better. But you don't need to be a pro or have a fancy studio to benefit from a quality mic. You may not realize it, but if you've been working from home or using Zoom to chat with friends, you probably spend a lot of time in front of a microphone. So why not sound your best? Whether you're doing video conferencing, podcasting, podcasting, recording music, or hosting a talk show, Blue has you covered. From the USB series that plugs right into your computer to XLR professional mics like the mouse or the Blueberry we use in the studio right now. Bottom line, there's a Blue microphone to fit your budget and need. I can't say enough about Blue mics, and once you try one, you will never go back. Trust me. To take your audio to the next level, go to drdrew.com slash blue. That is drdrew.com slash B-L-U-E. Anyone who's watched me over the years knows that I'm obsessed with Hydrolyte. In my opinion, the best oral rehydration product on the market. I literally use it every day. My family uses it. When I had COVID, I'm telling you, Hydrolyte contributed to my recovery, kept me hydrated. Now, with things finally reopening back around the country, the potential exposure to the common cold is always around. And like always, Hydrolyte has got your back. Hydrolyte Plus Immunity, my new favorite, starts with their fast-absorbing electrolytes and adds a host of great ingredients Plus, each single serving easy pour drink mix contains 1,000 milligrams of vitamin C, 300 milligrams of elderberry extract. Hydrolyte Plus Immunity comes in convenient, easy to pour sticks that rapidly dissolve in water, make a great tasting drink, has 75% less sugar than your typical sports drink. It uses all natural flavors, gluten free, dairy free, caffeine free, non GMO, and even vegan. Hydrolyte Plus Immunity is also now available in ready to drink bottles at the Walmart next to the pharmacy. Or as always, you can find it by visiting hydrolyte.com slash Dr. Drew. Again, that is H Y D R A L Y T E dot com slash D R D R E W. Be sure to use the code Dr. Drew25 for a special discount. Here with my daughter Paulina to share an exciting new project. Over the years, we've talked to a ton of young people about what they really want to know about relationships. It's difficult to know who you are and what you want, especially mm. as a teenager. And not everyone has access to an expert in their house like I did. Of course, it wasn't like I was always that receptive to that advice. Right, no kidding. But now we have written the book on consent. It is called It Doesn't Have to Be Awkward, and it explores relationships, romantic relationships, and sex. It's a great guide for teens, parents, and educators to go beyond the talk and have honest and meaningful conversations. It Doesn't Have to Be Awkward will be on sale September 21st. You can order your book anywhere books are sold. Mm -hmm. Amazon, Barnes & Noble, Target, and of course, your independent local bookstore. Links are available on drdrew.com. 
So pre-ordering the book will help people, well, raise awareness, obviously, and it'll get that conversation going early so more people can can notice this and spread the word of positivity about healthy relationships. So if you can, we would love your support by pre-ordering now. Totally. And as we said before, this is a book that both teenagers and their parents should read. Read the book, have the conversation. It doesn't have to be awkward. On sale September 21st. We are here with Jessica Hockman, pediatrician. Let's bring Jessica back up. A lot of strange stuff on Restream today. So those of you who are our frequent flyers there, we apologize, but it's kind of entertaining to have a new group in there, uh, whatever they're doing. I, I the, Somebody named uh, Gunval. Has is, to contact Caleb. He already gave me yeah. his information. But, okay, but good. Now, it's fine. If you guys want to be dicks and do this, that's He's going to clip fun, that but... one part where you just said his name and he's going to, it's going to be on his account in two minutes, surely. So he, this is good. what trolls love good. to do. Yeah, he <laughs> should enjoy. Will... I made somebody happy. That's good. Maybe he somebody want to learn more about uh, their children. I, I, I'm interested in people that have YouTube armies. That they should, they should, they, <laughs> it's they, funny they it's should like... be on our side. Uh, but I love batting trolls. So don't, don't piss me off. All right. Well, <laughs> There you go. I hope I'm pronouncing his name right. My favorite thing. Yeah, I hope I'm calling his name properly. And people want to pitch him for the show, so please give me the pitches right here. So, Jessica, before the break, we were talking about some of the side effects of vaccine therapy and our enthusiasm for vaccines, but our, our concerns about uh, mandates. And much like you, my concern is that uh, the physician-patient interaction has been ceded to authorities, and that's never good. It's a nuanced process. As you said, we should always have humility as we make our decisions and adjust course constantly and be able to re recalibrate our risk rewards as we move forward on behalf of patients. Authorities cannot do that. They don't know how to do that. They're not in a position to do that. They can't adjust course ever. And it's disrupting the practice of medicine in a way that I never imagined would happen ever. It's just unreal. But here we are. Uh, I feel that, uh, I don't know how your husband feels, but I feel like general medicine and primary care has been affected more than anything. Does he agree with that? I, I, he does agree with that, definitely. Um, yeah. I mean, I think I have some friends that are physicians that are happy with the mandate, some that I really respect. Um, you know, they think it just takes the decision away where maybe there shouldn't be a decision. Um, you know, instead of having families deliberate over it, just make the decision easier for them. Um, but to me, I just worry that there's potential negative outcomes from making a mandate, um, some, right. some unintended so, so, consequences. Yeah. Right. So let's talk about that. So myocarditis yes. in uh, adolescent males is somewhere around one per four to one per 6,000, maybe let's say, say one per 5,500, just to round it all out. That is a... That's going to be a large number of kids. Now, in terms of the individual risk, it's much like my 99% thing I was talking about a little while ago. It's not going to happen to you. 99% probability, not going to happen to you. But when you That's vaccinate right. millions of kids, when you vaccinate millions of kids, you're going to see hundreds, maybe thousands of cases. And some of those, when you get up into the thousands of cases, are not going to be fun. They're going to be bad. Yeah, as people are well, going to, when I, you I have an inflamed say, heart, you can get sudden cardiac death. And that's what happens. And so you'll say, go ahead. Well, I, I will say that most of these cases, you know, there's the one, some studies have shown one in 5,000 rates of myocarditis with the second vaccine for teenage boys. Mm -hmm. Some have shown, um, uh, you know, one in 20,000. I do think it's an important point to know that they do recover by and large of these cases. Um, kids do, you know, seem to recover, but you're right. We don't know long term what this means and also i wouldn't want that to be my child to have an infection of the heart i right. think is a you know right. if we can mitigate or lessen that risk i think it's important to think about how to do so so let, let's let's put even a brighter light on the myocarditis that we have seen thus far is it it all appears mild it all appears reversible although we don't yes. know the long-term consequence there could be myocardiopathy cardiomyopathy down the road we don't know yes. but we think not but that's on the small scale of delivery we're using now. When you start the large scale delivery of vaccine to, to adolescents, like huge scale, right? There's gonna be there's gonna be mild and there's gonna be severe. That's the way medicine works. Right. And when, if you know, right. I, I I figure if we see three severe cases of myocarditis that are publicized in a healthy kid, people are gonna go crazy. 
if if if, if well, there's a mandate. If right. there's not a mandate, it's just mandate. A, it's just an unfortunate outcome. Yeah, but go ahead. Right. No, I agree. Trust. You have. I worry about trust. Um, you want to make sure that the public trust the recommendations, especially when we go as far as making a mandate, because in the future, if we were to make a mandate again, <laughs> um, we would get a lot more pushback. So I do think, um, especially with children where the risk benefit ratio isn't that clear. So for example, if children uh, five to 11, if the hospitalization rate is one per every 250,000 kids, but then the hospitalization rate for myocarditis is somewhere around there, um, you know, I think, I think to make something a mandate, you really want to be clear that the benefit to risk um, is, is obvious, not, not uh, you know, wishy-washy. Right. And, and why do you figure they're not, it looks like they're not thinking that way. And I don't understand that. I, I worry that politics on, you know, I try to think with science and data and I do feel like yeah. um, politics is, is playing too large a role or it seems to be. I also think um, people are really fearful. I think we haven't done a good job delivering the message to um, parents that children really are at low risk. I mean, I, when I tell parents that good data shows that a vaccinated adult is still at higher risk of COVID complications than an unvaccinated child, they're all very surprised. Um, you know, cause I'll talk Why, to a lot of parents. I ima who, I'm imagining, yeah. let's talk, let's talk about that for a second. I'm imagining yeah. that is yeah. true by a couple orders of magnitude. Yes. And, uh, in England, they showed that people that are in their thirties and forties and vaccinated have, have harder outcomes from COVID when, than, than unvaccinated kids under 18. By, by a factor so of what it, though? I'm, I'm, it's not, it's not 10. I bet it's a hundred times. <laughs> Yeah, I don't know. I mean, just it's just because kids do so well. Um, you know, they're yes, because kids almost always are, do well. That's right, right, right. Almost always. That's right. It's it's point oh oh one versus point oh one risk, and there there it is. Right. And it, I, right. again, and, and there's I, this. There's this. Go ahead. And I do think. I mean, I I think that people are better at self at risk assessing their 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 own life better than we give people credit for. So, for example. Um, you know, when I talk to families where their kids have health conditions, they're the, they know that their kids are at higher risk and they, they can't wait to get the mm -hmm. vaccine. And then I'll talk to mm -hmm. families that will say to me, I don't know if I should be in a rush because my kids already had COVID. And I, I think those are valid questions. So I, yeah, yeah. And that's the risk reward analysis that you would do with your parent, your patients. Uh, and that, that's right. That has always, has always been the practice of medicine. How do you, how do you help people understand the difference between these vaccines and other mandated vaccines like measles? Okay, so first I would say that um, you know when when a child gets the measles vaccine, um, it dead ends measles. You know we don't see measles mutates very slowly, um, and a child really will not get measles again. For the COVID vaccine or for COVID, I I relate it more to a virus like the flu where we don't know how long the benefit's going to last for. So it's hard for me to, you know, how do we know we're not going to need a, a, a booster in six months for children or um, that we'll see mutations yearly? And I think, I think for a mandate, um, it would make more sense, number one, if it was a perfect vaccine so we didn't see breakthrough cases, um, which, right. we, which we will and we do. We did see some in the, in the right. Pfizer trial. And on the other side, yep. I think it would make sense if kids had really poor outcomes from COVID. So because um, we don't see really, you know, of course there have been kids that have, um, that have died. There's kids that have been hospitalized, but because the relative rates are, are looking so good, it's hard to, um, it's hard to feel good about m forcing people to do it. Right. The forcing is <laughs> the problem we're, we're worried about. And, yeah. Right. So, so I, I, you know, I'll say it again, I'm very pro vaccine. I'm very excited yep. to be giving the vaccine, but the part that feels funny is for you're right. If a is to make people do it, is to is to um, is to you know is to force it upon themselves. I also I really worry honestly about kids in the inner city um, because there's a lot of kids that don't have access to doctors or trustworthy you know or medical care that they trust. And um, for example, in San Francisco. Um, the black population, their percent of vaccine is over 20% uh, less than 
the then you know then all race is considered and so you know that would be awful mm -hmm. to have kids not go to school um for for lack of getting the covid vaccine you know i just i think i think that would be a much worse outcome for our future children than to right um this is yeah. what they yeah, you're you're doing a risk reward analysis you're saying you know what's worse <laughs> us keeping a, a us being engaged in a racist policy that keeps kids at risk out of school or the risk right. of covid which is nominal it's like give me a break all right let me uh, take a couple calls from um uh from I'm our, glad you our agree world with me. over here in clubhouse i do agree with you um i'm trying to get a uh, law animal trainer law animal trainer <laughs> Uh, um, you know, in French, you can't put two vowels together if the first word is an article uh, or a preposition. Sorry about that. Um, all right. As usual, that person does not seem to be coming up. Oh, there we are. Kristen. How are you? Hey, good. What's happening? Okay. Just question for you. So I was trying to, what are the, how many healthy children without comorbidities have died in the u.s and then just how many kids total i'm just wondering why the mandate like if the numbers are wild then you know what i mean yes I could... yes i get it that's what we're struggling with go ahead uh, jessica so okay it's a great question so in the united states there's been a total death uh count somewhere between mid, mid 500s to mid 600s however um and this is where i get frustrated with the data in the united states it's really hard to find out exactly how many kids in that group have had comorbidities Dr. Marty McCary um, from Johns Hopkins, he estimated that 10 to 20 of the kids that have passed away have been healthy kids, kids that didn't have comorbidities. So that's not all to right. say so, at all so every to, death, of course, matters. Uh, you know, every so death, of course, answer, matters. But, if you're a of a healthy kid. But, you, but you're going to save 20 healthy kids, you may give 10,000 kids myocarditis. So, huh. So, uh, so to answer your question, Kristen, of the 700,000 deaths in this country, 20 were healthy children. Is that right, Jessica? 20? That's from Dr. Marty McCary said that, yes. 20 were healthy children. Kristen, how does that make you feel? Well, yes, yeah, a mother of three young kids. And, you know, I live in California, which is like a pretty heavy state to deal with. And I pulled my kids out of preschool because they were mandating the masks, including it's interesting to hear you guys talk about it um, at recess, you know, outside for an hour and a half. I just, I couldn't stomach it. My twins are two, my son was four and I just was mortified. You know what I mean? Cause yeah. I, I work production. So I work long hours. So they'd be there a minimum of eight hours, you know, about eight, eight to nine hours. Yeah. And I just I was it. like, I don't, you know, at the end of a 15 hour day on set, my teeth are covered in like gross stuff. I have to change my mask. I'm sorry. I sh I'm getting graphic. It's all good. But oh, I know. I love gum. <laughs> <laughs> I should try that. But yeah, so it just, it feels uh, really confusing. And then you have these people that are angrily vaccinating their children. Because if you, if you just have like a question about it, like I work in an industry where we're all vaccinated, but if you have a question about it for your kid, you're Did your phone just ring? Yes, it did. It's just wild and, and a racist PS. You know what I mean? Yeah, like it just, yeah. it just you know what? I personally, you know, I don't know if Drew would just say, okay, we need to get the kids vaccinated. I would do it. Cause he, he would, it would be his decision. But if I had triplets in preschool and I, the vaccine was only a couple years old, I'd want to wait another year and see what the outcome was and make well, sure that but, I wanted to see the downside. You we know, we have a fair bit of data on it now. And again, yeah, you're to, save, to save 20 children, I'm not how, many, how many healthy kids are we going to make sick? But I mean, like, the question. Like, like what Dr. Jessica said, when kids get it, they get it and, and, and they get over and, it. And but, it's not and, too bad. but part of the problem is there's viral replication going on in these children and we're trying to suppress viral replication. So we reduce the risk of these variants developing. But the viral replication occurs even in the vaccinated population. But how does so the that viral argument, replication ha happen if you keep them in your house and they get over it? It's happening in the child. It's happening in the child. Oh, okay. Uh, See, and, I don't know anything about medicine, but yeah. I'm just telling you from a mother's perspective, yeah. I would I would just say I'd rather my kids just get the virus. Well, but but you are making a point within that that is well taken, which is and wait for the, the vaccine. Even, in six even if the child year. develops a variant, if he or she doesn't transmit it to anyone, 
who cares? <laughs> right. It has to, it has to move well, off that I, I child. Don't know. Into I completely else. feel for mothers. I would be freaking out if this was happening to my kids. Yeah, I get it. Well, I think I'll, honestly, what's also stressful at getting COVID is the, is the quarantine. I mean, I, it's hard for families. Mm -hmm. I, I think a lot of families would, would, that I talked to, they're not that scared of their child getting COVID, but they don't want to deal with staying home for 10 days. You know, it's definitely better to not get the virus if you don't have to. Um, sure. But I do think, yeah, but I, I do think though that there's a lot of, my, my general feeling on this is there's the fear of kids getting COVID. And I would say the fear over the vaccine has way outpaced the reality. Yeah, you know, I think both are yeah. actually very low risk situations. Let's say, um, I, let's say all 600 kids that died of COVID were healthy. Even then, yes. the argument right. for vaccination is kind of, it's it's intense. It's hard to make it. It's 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 a certain kind of. Or it's certainly mandates, not an argument really. about saving. Yeah, for mandates, it's certainly not an argument about preventing right. deaths. That would not be the argument right. because you're not really preventing deaths. You may be causing right. more deaths. We'll see. We don't know. Right. And so hopefully not. Hopefully. One not. argument I hear a uh, lot from families is they they feel like it's the right thing to do that if they're they want to vaccinate their mm -hmm. child to prevent spread to the elderly. And yeah, I and I, I understand that, that perspective. Um, but the counter to that is the counter to that is that we know that most people by and far that are by far and by far in a way that are dying of COVID are the unvaccinated that that if you've been if you know if you're worried for your your grandparent just I think the number one thing to do is make sure that they're vaccinated and and have a booster. Yeah. Amen. Hundred percent. Diane, uh, Diane's up at the podium here. Go ahead, Diane. Hi there. Thanks, everyone. Uh, this is very interesting. I wanted to know um, if either of you could say more about the Israel study that you uh, mentioned about the first dose effectiveness in teens um, and how that may be enough. Um, I have a 13-year-old niece who was vaccinated with Pfizer and also got the uh, second dose and doesn't seem to show any complications uh, four months later. Good. So I'm curious, you know, should she get the booster at six months or oh, well, that's could we possibly a, yeah. do? So let's, let's, let's ask we, the question specifically, because that's a good question. Should adolescents be getting a booster? And and by the way, the decision to vaccinate a 13 to 17 year old is an easier putt, I think, than a four to 10 year old, <laughs> five or five to right. 10 year old say that's a harder decision, but, but go ahead. So it's particularly for the females, but go ahead. Should they be boosted? Adolescents. I don't think so. Yeah, I don't. Uh, first of all, the the FDA is not or the CDC is not recommending boosters yet for under under eighteen. Um, right. But I, I, you know, I do believe that the first round of vaccines are holding up very well. That there are breakthrough cases that happen, but they generally tend to be mild. Um, but the first round of the vaccine does an incredible job of keeping people out of the hospital and from dying. So, especially in an adolescent group, I I would not recommend a booster at this time. So, and you think there's a probability that they will approve it? The boosters? I, I have a feeling they will just because it seems to be the not, path. Because that's maybe the way not. things are going. I, I think they're not going to. I just have a feeling that that's it for, they, they, they've sort of gone as far as they're going to go with uh, the adolescents because they really think about it. I mean, if the risk of myocarditis is after the second shot, who knows what we'll see after the third, right? That's a good point. Uh, yeah, I mean. Yeah. I don't want to think about it. Yeah, and in, in in Hong Kong and the UK, they're just recommending one dose for the teenagers. I I saw that. I've yeah. If that. I if, after what Douglas went through, With I what? would never have wanted to give him a vaccine because I know he would probably get something bad. You mean and Jordan had a horrible reaction to it when he he had the vaccine. He's yeah, our kids 29. had bad bad vaccine reactions. Yeah, uh, they they were sick really. Sick. But his kids like I sick don't enough know. that it kind of made me worry. They're like, oh crap, you know, we're gonna have a myocarditis here. We're gonna have a. I think Pauline drop. would have been fine. She's made yeah. of steel. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Well, this is all important information. Um, do you recommend? What do you recommend to the average patient that they discuss this with their pediatrician? Do you think they'll find a Absolutely. an audience for this yeah. conversation okay because our oh, profession has so gotten weird listening. in the last year yeah i do i mean i i think i'll say you know in my mind the big picture here is i just hope that kids get back to normal really soon um i think there's so I much guess. fear around around covid there's so much fear around their vaccine and i do think you know we're overthinking a lot that we should be 
you know, I'm seeing a lot of collateral damage because I think we're just tunnel vision thinking about COVID and I'm seeing kids gain weight. They're lonely, they're anxious, they're depressed. Um, and they're not seeing their friends. They're not playing in sports. And I really think, um, you know, I implore parents just to think about getting our kids back to normal, however that, however that may be. Yeah, I uh, did a presentation with this group called Gaggle, who has a lot of data on what's going on with adolescents and older childhood. And when you see what's happening as a result of the time they're spending on the screens with the yes. advent of these home screens and what they're doing with each other with that and what they're getting exposed to by the age of nine and the depression. True. The only thing that's not going, the only thing that has not gone up is suicide. Although there's been a lot of increase in suicidal thinking, particularly in younger females. Right. But my position is the reason the suicide itself hasn't gone up is because they are home with people on top of them all the time. They don't have an opportunity ah. to sneak off and do something. And so they may have Parental suicidal life. thinking, but they're around their family all the time, which is a good thing, but it's uh, making making it um, more difficult to actually attempt. And so I, I think that may be the reason that because the ideation is up, the ideation is up. And and yes. I I've been yes. I've seen this from the beginning. I've been in a I the, I saw the panic porn they were creating, and I people now are starting to speak more openly about you know, by people. I mean leaders and and thought leaders are talking a little more freely now about what was happening during the early stages of the pandemic. And I've talked to some you know academic leaders who when I they I say well, what 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 was that? What were you doing? And the the answer I'm getting now is a panic. We were in a panic which was obvious, and the panic was caused by the press. You weren't in a panic because yes. of COVID. You were in a panic because of what the press was doing to you. I kept telling people, don't yes. listen to the press. They have no they have no business even commenting on this. And the other thing right. that they say is, when we start talking about pandemic policy, that if you look at pandemic policy from five years ago, doesn't mention any of the things we did. We literally, the federal policy did not have the policies that we ended up creating and the reason we created the crazy policies we created, they will tell you now, people have said it to me out loud because China did it. And my wow. eye on what, what they did, I know it's really, it's striking. Is it when you hear that out loud and they, and to my eye, and this is my own little interpretation of this. What I saw going on with Wuhan was some sort of rehearsed procedure they had that was clearly already in place in case they had a catastrophe from the lab. I mean, the idea of chlorine containing trucks rolling down the street, where did they come from? They were already on hand somewhere to roll out if if the virus got out of the lab, right? To wash so it down they, the drain. They locked down the way they had rehearsed locking down, also to look good in the eyes of the leaders, you know, back in, in Beijing. Uh, so there was a wholly different set of circumstances than what the rest of the world was contending with. And yet we all modeled what we did after what they did, which didn't work, by the way, there yeah. or anywhere else. So it's all very, very, very strange for me. I, I hope we take a really good look at uh, what we did here. Because and I, we I don't agree learn with you about it, the media, I think. Been for not. Yeah, I think I think the media, you know, it makes sense. Like we're, we're, there's an addiction just to to pay attention, to be informed, to know what's going on. But I absolutely see a negative um, effect from it. I, I feel like I can't tell you how many patients I talk to that don't speak to a family member. They have strained relationships with friends because you know they follow something on on Instagram or they follow something on social media and they disagree with their friend and their friends comment. And I think it's doing a lot of harm that, you know, I, I, oh my God, yes. I don't know what to do about it, but it's, it's very clear well, that the I media is kind of feel like what, what I've seen is it's driven us into a histrionic posture, uh, where sort of histrionic disorders seem to be, they were very rare when I was working yes. in the psychiatric hospital. Now they're rather common and histrionic tends to the delusional. And the way to break through delusion is with reality to come crashing in. So something's got to bring reality on reality's terms to bear. And that's, that's what will start things turning. I, I don't know what that is, uh, but I know that's what happens with uh, narcissist cluster B histrionic type stuff. So, well, Jessica, it's been a privilege and a pleasure. Yeah. Thank you for taking time to spend some time with us. It's been clarifying a, a lot of things I've been thinking 
and things I've been worrying about with pediatrics for a long time <laughs> and finally got my questions answered. It's uh, as I suspected, good. but re with good reason. And uh, and thank you for your careful thought about your patients and about vaccine therapies. And it's just, you know, really, if I stand back from what you're saying is humility and careful, you know, be humble with your decision making. Don't be certain about anything and be careful in your in your risk reward analysis. What could be bad right, about I think that? Why, why could take issue, anybody take issue with that? Well, my heart Thank goes you so out much. to all the parents who have lost somebody, you know, in this in this experience. It's just it's oh, yeah. it's terrifying. Look, Absolutely. Pandemics are defined. Pandemics means the word pandemic means excess death per year, year on year, excess death. And that's awful. Pandemics are awful. H1N1 cleared 400,000 people. It it's nasty when but when, when you're making pain. decisions for your children and you, something like that happens, you can't live with yourself. I mean, you just, you want to die. Something like you want to die first. When something like what happens? If they have an, a, a horrible outcome. From the know? vaccine or from yeah, the Yeah, or something, you know, anything you do for your kids. Like you you make a decision and it doesn't work. So this is making you anxious having this oh, conversation. Oh, it makes me so terribly what, so, anxious. So what would you have oh. done? What would your... your the, the, I already told you what I would no, do. No, 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 no. So the risk of myocarditis for your boys would be one per 5,000. Risk of death, 20 per 700,000. What are you going to do? I would wait until I knew more. That's your, your thing. You're waiting. waiting I'd rather they get COVID. And I, just, I think this, go to the sad truth they get is... The vaccine. Sad truth? I was gonna say that I think the sad truth is that no, there's no option ever that's zero risk, right? So Correct. if when I take my Correct. kids in the car and go to school, there's a little bit of inherent risk when I do that, right? Um, mm -hmm. Just, no, just by nature of, of living. And so I agree, I think, mm -hmm. you know, it's important for families to consider their own risk, make a good decision. Um, mm -hmm. And, and I think, um, you know, I, I, I do think that kids by and large are very low risk. So I encourage, you know, parents to send their kids to school and allow them to participate yes. in after school activities, and things I, like that. But of course, talk to your doctor. Yeah. I I would just want to wait as long as possible. That's all. Well, Chris, your friend Christina And I, I wouldn't want to bow down to the rules like you have to do this because, you know, the government says you have this to do it. This is that control and, and yeah, I would. Person, I, I'm Jessica. not good with that stuff. I, I don't. I, it's like I want to make the own, my decision for my children because they came out of me, and this is my decision. You know. Well, here's what I like. Uh, Chris, I don't know. I you would be like, he'd have to put up with me, and I don't know. He might actually let me have my way because I'm. Yeah. When when I decide stuff like that, he has to listen. Yeah, yeah. I, I get these are hard decisions. He would have to really persuade me. But but I I, I, I will say though the that the vaccine looks. It, it, I will say though that the vaccine for anybody out there, you know, that's that's thinking about getting it, it does look very mm -hmm. safe. I mean, we've been giving in our office, and yeah. I haven't seen any reactions. Um, and the five to eleven that's year good. old group is getting a third of the dose that twelve and older is getting. So hopefully we'll see mm -hmm. even fewer side effects because of the lower dose. Um, but right. I think you're you're in the right to want to ask questions. I think that is completely reasonable and and smart. I would just want to wait like six more months or a year. Well, what I, what I like is that uh, Christina and I, when we first started talking, developed the rational revolution. And this conversation <laughs> has been quite rational. And that's what I like. <laughs> okay. So, so you can, you can except for tell, me, your, except for that tell crazy your friend mother Christina over there. that the rational revolution this is, the sign? is underway. This is the sign? Okay. That's the sign. It's, 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 I it's like your, it. it's your it's a le left hand uh, up towards your face. So okay. <laughs> that's it. Okay. I would be um, proud to be part and, of the uh, rational rational thinking rash revolution and you've got to get the uh we got to get you a mug because the, the mugs put the mug up there so <laughs> okay, jessica still can see have it the mug I, so, the mug's still available yeah, i'm sure look. it's still available those have been iconic can you put it up caleb do we have it available no, he probably doesn't have it. i don't you, think she will it. love it because it's so funny oh it's too bad because it's it's she and i both with this sort of uh early 20th century Soviet iconography, yeah, you know, having our yeah, send us your address leading out of the train, for Christmas. telling <laughs> Lenin, Lenin <laughs> oh, esque poses, both of us. <laughs> I need Bo to order some of those for Christmas. Both guests. of us. In oh, Lenin and also show everybody your bobblehead really quick while we're talking oh, about yeah. tchotchkes. This is something Susan invented, so everyone yeah, enjoy. Yeah, they're coming soon. <laughs> enjoy, enjoy. They're they're out. They're off the coast Christmas of Long Beach now. It's apparently, coming. gotta get those. Uh, That's Dr. too funny. Drew How do they get that? They'll be available soon at via drdrew.com. Okay. 
Let's let Jessica go. Right. She has work Check to do. Back. Jessica, we, we, we've, we've, this is we've it. exceeded this is the, time? the time limit. Yes. I bye, Jessica. Go like this. See, see, Thank you so much. I had a lot of fun. Yeah. So, all right, buddy. Thank you so much. We'll see you soon down at Laguna. Take <laughs> care. You. And uh, you bye soon. to Jessica. And uh, not bye to me yet. So uh, all you guys, let me do say goodbye, though, to. I am a nervous wreck right now. I know I could tell. I'm giving my opinion. Well, not just your opinion, but you also. Uh, I feel it. It's like, this, I mean, I told you the analogy yesterday, right? No. It's like when fake boobs came out oh. in the 70s. Yes. I said I wanted to wait and see what it was like 10 see, years. See how it is. Before how I would make that, I was flat chested. But see. I thought, you know, I want to wait 10 years. And I saw some bad outcomes. So I don't know. I like to see a little time. So I'm going to end the room in Clubhouse. We thank you guys for having joined us there. Uh, we've got a few calls in. Thank you. And uh, those of you out on the restream, um, I, I couldn't pay enough attention to you guys to understand exactly what was going on there, but it was kind of interesting. So DX means what it sounds like if you Diagnosis? sound it out. No, if you Dox. sound it out. Doxing, yeah. No, dicks. Oh. The. So what does that mean? Dick? What? So They were calling us dicks. Did they? No. I don't know. That's what somebody Caleb, said. I don't Caleb know. Moses. What's, Wait, what is, I don't know. Uh, yeah, what is they, it? they have not quite yet defined it to me, so I'm not saying it, <laughs> but they told me it would not get in the way of me running for president later. So I choose to trust the trolls, I guess. <laughs> These aren't trolls, though. These are not trolls. These are not haters. You know you're going to run for president. They, they That's seem so exciting. like they're Ganwal's army. Nation2040.com. <laughs> they, they're... Doctor, they're saying Doctor X. I don't know. Doctor Dix. Um, yeah, you guys aren't being bad. I, I, I mean, no, I, I know. We, you're I, welcome here. It's you're fine. I just, here. I like to ha see the comments in between, and it's like you have to keep scrolling. And yeah, it, it makes it, it hard for people it, that want to chat. Together. I mean, it's okay to do it once each, but twelve times each is just a little excessive. I know this is late, but here's the usually mug. It, I did, I didn't, uh, I didn't block anybody. Sure. So. You got to email it to, uh, got to email it to Jessica. So email it to me, and I'll send it to her. So she can uh, know what that is. Well, you know, I've been called worse. All right. So if we'll kind of wrap fine, things up. We it. don't want Caleb to miss the baby bath time tonight. That'd be two in a row at our, <laughs> that, our, that, that uh, oh, we wait. caused. We don't want that. Hmm? Oh, no. What Dave, was that? Is there... He's good. He's all good. Okay. Good. Uh, all right. Baby. So now, you know. uh, we are in here the next couple of days around the same time. We're in tomorrow at 330 because you got that. Thing. I'm seeing 3.15. 3.15. Uh, and then 4 o'clock, no, 2.30 on uh, <coughs> Thursday. Uh, and then next week, I believe we have some interesting guests. Isn't next week where we have uh, yeah, you have uh, Dr. Bhattacharya, right? Is finally. that next week? Yeah. Uh, and then we also have the following week is when we have finally have uh, Vinay Prasad. We have good and guests. And Alex Berenson, just for the end of the now we gotta Now we got to start um, planning... We have actually um, somebody named Dr. Lucy McBride. I'm not sure who she is. You you probably sought her out. Um, but we have to start booking for December. <laughs> so you have to submit your ideas to Great. Uh, Michelle. Also, um, yeah, and then we've got to you know, start planning that. Okay. Oh, because this we is are an episode about babies. The Here's the the today's photo McBride. of Camden. Oh, oh cute. There's, we did this at a pumpkin oh, patch. Look at that this face. This Halloween t shirt. <laughs> <laughs> Next Does time I'll have this Christmas photo. When you do that? Oh, oh. I've had yes. an eye full Oh, of, yeah. Of I hold him up way up high. That's do. his new thing, is he's spitting because he's trying to go drooling on you. But all he knows is to do is yeah. spit. So <laughs> he gets so frustrated. Yeah, you get a mouth <laughs> eyeball full of spit. or It's all over. Oh, yeah. it's, good. it's always. It's good stuff. <laughs> Juicy. <laughs> All right, you guys. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, we will see you tomorrow around Try the, three same of those at the same time. time. See you then. <laughs> Ask Dr. Drew is produced by Caleb Nation and Susan Pinsky. As a reminder, the discussions here are not a substitute for medical care, diagnosis, or treatment. This show is intended for educational and informational purposes only. I am a licensed physician, but I am not a replacement for your personal doctor and I am not practicing medicine here. Always remember that our understanding of medicine and science is constantly evolving. Though my opinion is based on the information that is available to me today, some of the contents of this show could be outdated in the future. Be sure to check with trusted resources in case any of the information has been updated since this was published. If you or someone you know is in immediate danger, don't call me, call 911. If you're feeling hopeless or suicidal, call the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline 
at 800-273-8255. You can find more of my recommended organizations and helpful resources at drdrew.com slash help.